Well, good morning. For those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Taylor Leachman. It's a joy to be together with you this morning, continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. If you would, please turn with me now. If you have a personal Bible, it'll also be shared with you uh, on your screen as well. We're turning to Mark chapter 9, and we're actually going to begin a little earlier than our, uh, than our particular passage that we're looking at together this morning. We're going to look at verse 38 all the way through verse 50. So if you would, Please join with me now in reading God's word. John said to him, him being Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Let's pray with you. Would you pray with me as we consider God's word together this morning? Father, we do thank you. We thank you that even as Willis helped to remind us this morning that you are the one who calls us to worship. Father, and we thank you that you have spoken to us. You've spoken to us through your word, and I pray that the, li- the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My wife and I have been wanting to see the musical Hamilton for as long as it's been out. Um, But because of how costly it is to go to New York, much less buy a ticket to get, uh, to to go actually into one of the Broadway uh, theaters, we couldn't afford doing it. And even when Houston, uh, when, when the musical decided to come to Houston, we figured it wasn't quite worth the cost. So this past week, When Disney Plus released Hamilton, we were so excited and watched it with enthusiasm. For those of you all who've been living under a rock, Hamilton is the musical, the incredible musical about the life and the pursuits of Alexander Hamilton as as one of the founding fathers of our country. And while Hamilton and other characters throughout the musical are incredibly entertaining and well put together, I think my favorite character of the whole musical has got to be the antagonist. It's got to be King George, right? If you remember your history, King George is the English king during the Revolutionary War, and he is characterized hilariously throughout the musical, but his best appearance of all three or four appearances that he makes is his first one. He struts out on the stage with, uh, with power and opulence and wealth, completely out of touch with reality. And he begins to sing the following words. You say, the price of my love is not a price that you're willing to pay. You cry. And your tea, which you hurl in the sea when you see me go by. Why so sad? Remember, we made an arrangement when you went away. Now you're making me mad. Remember, despite our estrangement, I'm your man. You'll be back. Soon you'll see. You'll remember you belong to me. You'll be back. Time will tell. You'll remember that I served you well. Oceans rise. Empires fall. We have seen each other through it all. And when push comes to shove, I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. 
da. If you've seen it, you know what I'm doing there. But besides being hilarious, the song captures the mindset of this absent, completely confused and demanding king. Right? He uses his power and his influence in order to force the love of his subjects. And if we're honest, we can have a similar mindset about God in these particular times. Why, God, if if the world is so seemingly crazy right now, are you still so absent? If we are rebellious, as your Bible teaches us, is are all the hard things that we're going through, the harm and the struggle, is that a way for you to show us your love? Are you distant? Are you as demanding even as this passage that we have read seems? Because our passage this morning does feel very much like Jesus is out of touch and overly demanding. But it is far different than it looks at first. We'll see as we look at this passage together that Jesus is far more gracious than we could possibly understand. But in addition to that, that grace is not cheap. So we're going to look at this passage in three parts. First, the pride of the disciples. Second, the cost of discipleship. And third, the grace that Jesus has for his disciples. Let's look first at the pride of the disciples. The disciples, if you remember, through our journey in the Gospel of Mark, have been with Jesus. They've been following him, and in particular recently, chapters 8 and 9, the 12 disciples are beginning to feel a little bit good about themselves, right? They, they want to know, not even just you know, that they are great by being the 12 disciples, but among the 12, they want to know who is the greatest, right? They want also Jesus even to begin to understand things about his own kingdom, They rebuke Jesus about his kingdom. They teach Jesus, supposedly, about what is and what should not be true of the kingdom of God. But even as the passage we read and talked about last week talked about, the disciples want to bask in the glory that they began to witness in the transfiguration. So that leads into verse 38 where we picked up this morning. The disciples see, they see someone out there trying to cast out a demon-possessed man. They see, this is not one of the 12. Could, it could be one of Jesus' thousand disciples, as the different Gospels make reference to, or it could be someone maybe even only just tangentially involved, only someone who heard one of Jesus' sermons. But John is incensed that this person is copying them. He is doing our stuff without being one of us, right? He is an outsider. He's not a proprietor of our form of exorcism. He did not get our permission to use this intellectual property. And not only did this outsider use our inside info, but he did so successfully, Right, so John, feeling somewhat superior because right, he's in the inner circle, he's one of the 12, and he desires for that to come with certain benefits, right, this actually is, is what's making him even envious of this person. He doesn't want this other Christian, right? this Christian being someone who is casting out demons in the name of Jesus, or we could even say by faith in Jesus. He doesn't want this person to go about performing this copycat ministry. So he tells Jesus, kind of proudly it seems, that he stopped this man from doing this. And Jesus responds. He tells him that anyone who is doing this in his name is with them. Thus that anyone who is placing faith in Jesus is a disciple. There is no inner circle. There are only disciples of Jesus. There are only citizens of the kingdom of God, and we are not a kingdom divided. How often do we act as a series of Christian inner circles? Right? We believe that, that we, right, we do Christianity the right way. God, take away their ministry. Those people or that church are not a part of us. We do it the right way. 
with, with hymns or contemporary music or the right blend of both or with, with historic liturgy or improvisational prayer with weekly communion or quarterly communion and robes in a pulpit or t-shirt and brightly lit stage, right, as we take that attitude of us versus them, we invariably divide God's kingdom and assume some sort of a hierarchy within it. The perfect Christians, us, are versus the other or lesser Christians, them. Or or if we don't view it in this sort of two-tiered hierarchy, we can almost view it as like an archery target of concentric circles. The the awesome ones, us, are in the center with each circle out getting further and further away from the kingdom of God. I want to apply this very specifically to our current situation right now in the church. This mindset is rampant amongst Christians right now. We have splintered over theology in the past and even maybe right now as well, over missional engagement, over musical instrumentations, but we have also splintered right now over the response to COVID-19. We have a series of concentric circles about the right response to that. The right Christians have our views. And people who disagree with us are outside of that. They are not us. We've splintered over our response to racial tensions. We've splintered over our thoughts about politics and the upcoming election. And, And I'm not meaning that we as a country have splintered, although we could certainly talk about that and certainly say that. But I mean we as a church who share the same faith in the same Lord, have splintered over these things. And as we have splintered and as we have divided ourselves up, we've invariably said, Lord, I tried. I tried to stop them from doing that type of ministry in your name. I didn't didn't recognize them. They weren't one of us. But how conceited and arrogant to assume that the kingdom of God is only as narrow as our own particular views and actions. Jesus teaches us here that no matter how right we may be on a particular issue, it is absolutely wrong to completely discount another person's ministry or another church's ministry if that ministry is by faith in Christ. The kingdom of God is bigger than we might expect. It may seem small as a mustard seed, but it is growing far larger than we could ever dream to the point that birds are perching and resting in the branches of that very kingdom of God. But beyond kind of our own exclusive or self-important ideas, Jesus goes further in attacking and helping us to see our own pride. He says in verse 42, that whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. In the words of Will Ferrell's character from the movie Anchorman, that escalated quickly. It almost seemed to come out of nowhere. Where did these little ones come from? Who are they? And where did this harsh punishment come from? It's like kind of turn Pinocchio into a donkey and toss him into the ocean type of harsh. It seemingly comes out of nowhere. Well, the little ones or children make up a lot of what's going on in Mark's chapters 9 and 10. Right, there's clear evidence in these chapters that children are all around. We read earlier in chapter 9 that when Jesus tells his disciples and teaches them that the last shall be first, he pulls a child in front of them as exhibit A. But also later in chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus rebukes his disciples for trying to keep children from approaching him. But it's not just specifically about literal children. Because later in chapter 10, Jesus refers to his disciples as children. And here in our passage He's not speaking literally about children either. All throughout this section, children, whether literal or figurative, serve to demonstrate that that those who have nothing to offer, those who are not sufficient into and uh, in themselves and unto themselves, that they are insignificant ones. 
And that was, that was actually true, as harsh as it sounds, that was true of children at the time. Right? They could not ease the economic or the work burden of the family unit. So that's true of particular children. That was true of, of unknown people that were not doing significant ministry in the name of Jesus. And that's true of the innermost circle of the disciples of 12, the 12 disciples. That's true of them. That's true of us. They are and we are insignificant. We cannot see ourselves as assets to the kingdom of God. We are not assets. We are loved, but we are not significant and helpful. A couple weeks ago, my family and I got to go on vacation to Colorado. I I love doing it. We do it every year. And the first part, uh, we sort of do an indoor version of camping and make a lot of fires and grill out outside. Um, And I I love making a fire, but recently I started letting the children make the fire before we cook. It is certainly not faster or more helpful for me to do that. I am faster and better at building a fire than they are. But I want them to help for two reasons. Yes, uh, one, I want them to learn how to do it, and they will get better and probably be better than me at it at one point. But secondly, I let them do it because... I delight in them. I love to watch their eyes sparkle as they learn something new about the way that God made the world. And this is what God does with us. We're not actually helping, but he delights for us to participate because he loves to watch us learn more about him and more about his kingdom. And just because we have a role to play doesn't make us special and helpful. He loves us. But that love is costly. And that leads to our second point, the cost of discipleship. As we mentioned earlier, the little ones are the insignificant followers of Christ, or we could even say all of us. But why does Jesus talk about millstones being hung around the necks of those who cause Christians to sin? This punishment was not made up by Jesus. He didn't pull it out of thin air. It was actually a a punishment that was used during that day and age. And and the millstone that is being referred to is not not a hand milling uh, sort of stone here. This is a, a grain mill being pulled by a donkey kind of big stone that's being talked about. And this was an actual punishment that was used by the Romans in that day and age. And it was heinously viewed by the Jews because not only was it a punishment unto death, but the body of the one who died was unable to be buried afterward. So it was particularly heinous. It was particularly offensive to the Jewish people. And Jesus is picking up this particular image to help us to see the terrible consequences of our own action of authority, of our own action of Christian leadership or just Christian life in general, that if we lead others out of pride and conceit, that there are terrible consequences for that. That if we are to cause an insignificant follower of Christ to sin from a position of authority, that that is particularly heinous. He's teaching that the disciples of Jesus who, who have authority, right, and, and therefore all Christians with authority, they must be mindful and careful with that authority. We must never use it for our own selfish gains. But rather, we're to be cognizant of the other followers of Christ in our midst to care for them and to push them by faith toward Jesus. But Jesus goes beyond this warning. He not only teaches the disciples to be careful of their leadership, but but he also warns them to be careful in their personal lives. He teaches them that they must flee the temptation to sin. Better to worry about your own life than to be a hall monitor for everybody else. He says, if your hand, if our hand causes us to sin, it's better to cut it off than to die in sin. If your foot causes you to sin, it's better to cut it off and and to enter the kingdom of God lame than to die in sin. If your eye causes you to sin, it's better to pluck it out than to live life apart from God. 
Is Jesus teaching us to maim ourselves physically? What would be left of ourselves if we truly removed parts of our body or our life that caused us or tempted us to sin? I would imagine if you're honest with yourself, you would recognize that there wouldn't be anything left. No, Jesus is not teaching us that we should do these things literally. But rather, we need to take the consequences of sin seriously. The Westminster Catechism, which is our denomination's standards, uh, uh, teaches that, that sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Now, that's a very fancy and pithy statement in and of itself, but what does it mean? It means that sin is when we refuse to do or conform to be the things that God tells us to do or be. But more than that, that sin is also when we do the things that he tells us not to do. So when we kind of boil all that down, sin is our rebellion against God. It's us thinking that what we want is better and for, better for ourselves and is right over and against what God says. Sin is an elevation of ourselves at the expense of God and others and acting that out in a particular way. What are the things in your life that tempt you to sin? What are the things in your life that tempt you to do things your own way, to disregard the wisdom of God and to assume wisdom for yourself? We're living in a very particular time right now, and I would imagine that it's easy for a lot of things to consume us. So let me ask pointedly, does Fox News or CNN or NPR or the 24-hour news cycle lead you into temptation to sin, to stay angry? Does the news cycle keep you from trusting in God's sovereignty, enslaving you to a spirit of fear? Are you trusting more in a political party or a political solution than you're trusting in the creator of heaven and earth? The king of kings, the lord of lords, the president of presidents. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you've just been checking out because it's too much, right? But, but what else are you using right now to, to check out? Maybe emotionally, maybe, maybe physically, right? The stress and anxiety of life in a pandemic is so challenging. How are you coping? Do you recognize the stress and anxiety in your life? And do you allow for it to drive you back to faith in Christ? Or... Do you simply seek to avoid engagement with your troubles or with God himself? And as we think about these particular sins, and there's many more that I could list, do you treat those things in your life as NBD, no big deal? God is gracious. He certainly doesn't care about that type of stuff. He knows how crazy the world is right now, and it's not like I'm killing anybody or killed anyone in the past. We tend to treat sin in our life in much the same way that we treat like a, a minor cut or a bruise. It's not that big of a deal. It may hurt a little bit, but it, it won't do any real damage. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous work, The Cost of Discipleship, he writes this about our temptation to view God's grace cheaply. He says, Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. When we so quickly dismiss or overlook sin in our lives, we are practicing cheap grace. But in reality... Sin is much more sinister. Sin leads to death. It is far closer to cancer than it is to a cut or a bruise. It mutates and it takes that which is, is bad or it takes that which is good and makes it bad. It, it takes that which is life and makes it death. And often it's, it's spreading and causing destruction far more than we ever even recognize in our own life and in the lives of others around us. The more that we entertain sin, the more that we are walking a path to death itself. And in this passage, Jesus wants to redirect our path. 
He says that it's better to lose a part of ourselves or even our life than to go to hell. And this is not a particularly popular passage to look at. Hell is not a particularly positive uh, thought to be thinking about on Sunday morning. But Jesus is saying that there is an eternal consequence of our sin. That in our rebellion, we actually desire to be in a place like hell, to be away from God. We desire to move away from the source of life, even if it leads to destruction and punishment. So this whole section with with crazy mutilation type stories should help us and his disciples to see just how big of a problem sin actually is. But we can't stop there. We go further to our third point to see the grace that Jesus has for his disciples. When I was a kid, I thought that the whole point of Christianity was to get as many get out of hell free cards as possible, right? And maybe some of you have thought something similar. Much like playing the game Monopoly, I tried to collect as many of those cards as I possibly could. I, again and again and again, I prayed the sinner's prayer, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, I confess it, and I, I have faith in you, so save me. I prayed it over and over again hoping that that if if one of them didn't take, that maybe the accumulation of them would somehow make it work. But as I grew older, and I benefited from wise and uh, uh, Bible-believing and wise mentors, pastors and friends who had a much bigger view of God's grace, I realized that my views of Christianity were another sort of cheap grace. The cheapness was not in my desire to justify my own sinful actions. No, it it was rooted in my unwillingness or my unbelief to believe that God's grace could be as big as the Bible says it is. So as, as we talk about sin this morning and as we talk about hell, I want to say clearly and emphatically that God's grace extends as far as the east is from the west. As we said earlier in our worship service, it is as high as the heavens. It goes from the depths of the sea to the height of the mountains. There is nothing that we have done or there is nothing that we have refrained from doing that can keep us from his grace. There is no amount of right living or right praying or right sacrifice that will cover it. You cannot cut off enough of your leg to atone for your sin. You cannot say the sinner's prayer enough times to atone for your sin. You cannot feel guilty enough to atone for your sin. But the good news for us this morning is that this big grace comes to us freely through Jesus Christ. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. His sacrifice was enough to atone for our sins. Were we actually to try to atone for our our own sins, let's just say we actually did try to cut off our sinning hand or, or gouge out an offending eye. As gruesome as that would be, it would only be a foretaste, a teeny, tiny measure of what our sin deserves. And while Jesus may not be literally asking for us to do that very thing, to mutilate ourselves, he is definitely calling for us to cut sin off at its root. And it will be painful. Right? It, it's, it's hard to turn off the TV and trust that the Lord, that the, that the Lord won't f- let the world fall apart all around us. It's hard to choose to engage with our children or our spouse when we've been stuck in the same house with them all day long and we just want five minutes to ourselves. In the same way that that this teeny tiny piece of bread that we receive at communion points us toward the future glorious hope that we have of that meal with him one day. So does this gruesome image of mutilated bodies point us to the heinous reality of eternal death and its consequences, the consequences of sin. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the same book that I quoted from earlier, The Cost of Discipleship. Yes, he writes that grace isn't cheap, but he goes on and he talks about the costliness of grace. He says, such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. There's good news for us this morning, and it's twofold. One, no matter what your sins are in the past, in the present, whatever you have done that is huge, whatever your thought life is, etc., if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins can be or are forgiven in him. His grace is enough. But it goes beyond that. That while the grace of Jesus Christ is, it is his grace alone that saves, that grace never comes to us alone. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can face our sin. And I invite you to be honest about it, whatever it is that you are struggling with or struggling against. Perhaps be honest with someone. Give me a call. Call one of our pastors. Call Willis. Call Pastor Clay Holland. Call Andres Zelaya as well. Anybody, an elder, a friend. We would love to hear about what is going on in your life and to point you back to Jesus Christ as you struggle daily against your sin and it will be a daily struggle. Know that God's grace is enough for you. It is a joy to be reminded of how big our sin is because it allows for us to see just how big God's grace is. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that your grace is that big, that you love us that much, that you sent your own son to die for us. And we pray, Father, that we would respond to your grace, that we would understand how much it covers us, and that it would lead us in power and wisdom to face our sin each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name, by the Spirit.